by introducing Megan from the Australian National Maritime Museum, um, who will be our first presenter today. Hello, everyone. So uh, welcome to the Australian National Maritime Museum. I am so super amazing, excited to be here today. Because um, I'm sure just like you guys have uh, been learning from home, I've had to be teaching from home as well. So. I actually am not standing in front of a virtual background. This is the actual Sydney Harbour. So I'd like everyone to have a think. Do you think you've been here before? Hand up if you have been to the Australian National Maritime Museum before. And I'm sure in your classes, there's a real mix. Some people who have and some people who haven't. Um, and so this is actually a great place to visit either with your school or maybe come in the school holidays. We always have great stuff for you guys to do. But my name is Megan and I work in our education team um, as digital education project officer. I've been talking to lots of kids like you over virtual excursions for the last few months. And this is gonna be a totally different session. So if anyone's uh, seen anything from the museum before, this is totally different because I wanna know what you guys want to talk about. So have a think, we'll have some questions and I'm gonna let uh, the students kind of lead this session. But before we do that, I do wanna just say what a museum is. So a museum like the Australian National Maritime Museum is a collection of stuff. And most people don't know, but you guys actually own this stuff. So if you live anywhere in Australia and uh, you are, you're part of this great nation, you own a teeny tiny little bit of all of our national collections, like the collection at the Australian National Maritime Museum. So you can see that ship out there with the number 11, that's called Vampire, and that is the largest object we also have lots of other uh, vessels, so boats. We have a helicopter inside, and we have lots of little items as well that tell us all about our history, but also science, so animals and things like that as well. And museums like us, we actually look after these objects to be able to show them to you in exhibitions, in talks like this one, and also to look after them for the future generations. So we have to care for them and preserve them. And so if anyone has any questions about that, keep that in mind, because we can answer that later on as well. But I'm gonna ask Karen to now pop up a poll, because what are you guys more interested today? If you're a class or you're, you're a teacher in a classroom, take a bit of a survey. Are you more interested in maritime history or marine animals? So what type of things do you want to talk, do you want me to talk about today? All right, because here at the museum, we have huge amounts of different things relating to the sea, the ocean. And a lot of people in the past have thought we're only about the Navy. And the Navy is kind of like the army, but in the water. So they have boats and, and um, helicopters and things like that to protect our country. And we have a huge amount about Navy history, but we also have history like the First Fleet and Captain Cook, exploration history, um, and all these different types of ways that people have used boats to get to Australia. But we also love science, and I can see you guys love science too. So I'm gonna show you a little bit more about marine animals today and uh, we'll have time for some questions as well. So here at the museum, when we have our beautiful uh, specimens and our beautiful objects, we have to take a lot of care of them. And I'm actually just gonna swap my camera to show you. My camera turned off. Let me just turn that back on. Sorry about that. Um, so here at the museum, we love to take care of our objects. 
And we take care of them in a lot of ways. And whether it's, oh, I've lost my mouse. <laughs> okay. There we go. So our museum will take care of objects and pack them up in really special ways in paper, in materials that aren't going to harm them. So all of these materials are going to be safe over time. There's not going to be any, um, any danger to the artifacts. And they're in a nice box. So we actually can keep them away from sunlight. And it's really important that we keep all of these objects away from sunlight because that can damage them over time. I'm sure people have seen an old photograph or something like that that's been damaged over time. So that's why I'm going to put the lid back on this box. So a lot of our objects are kept in boxes like this, but other objects are on display, like our little fairy penguin here. And actually I'll change the camera again. So you had a good question there. So what damage can sunlight do? So whether it's two objects that are made of a natural material like paper or wood, um, or even things like feathers, feathers, um, wool and cotton fabrics, things like that, the sun actually damages those objects over time because all of those, um, like the same types of rays that burn our skin when we're in the sun for too long, they can actually break down the natural fibers and the natural materials. And it can actually, it causes yellowing. So you might've seen old photographs that are really yellow and it can actually really damage things um, so that they fall apart. So like our feathers on our little penguin here. So our little penguin here, you wouldn't believe it, is over a hundred years old. Right, my camera up a little bit. Oh, that's a bit of a reflection there. You can see all of his little feathers there. And he's over a hundred years old. So he's not alive anymore. So he's what we call taxidermy. So with a specimen like this, so lots of different museums around the world use taxidermy. And what they do is they'll get an animal who has died. Uh, commonly it'll be an animal who might've lived in a zoo um, or been a pet. Um, but it can also, in the past, it used to be sometimes animals from the wild. And after that animal had died, they would preserve it so that scientists can actually use it to learn more about these animals. Um, so there, everything is, that you see on the outside is real except for the eyes. So all his feathers, the beak, his feet, all of that is all real, but everything inside has been taken out. So the real skeleton is not in there anymore or any of the flesh and organs or anything like that, that's all taken away. But taxidermy is really interesting because it allows us and scientists to learn about these animals. And it would allow scientists in different parts of the world to study animals as well. So I'm now gonna ask you guys a question about one of another object that we've got here. What do you think this is? What do you think this could be? So it's not related to our penguin. Pop it in the chat and I'll just open up the chat. Well, we've got uh, someone suggesting a whale bone, a branch, yeah, and I can see someone says fossil as well. Um, this is actually whale bone. So it is, it is whale bone. And actually, if someone's there saying vertebrae, it is also a vertebrae. So I want everyone to feel on the back of your neck. Oh, well done, everyone there who said bone. That's amazing. So I'm going to put it down for a sec. Feel on the back of your neck. That is your vertebrae. 
That's part of your spine that goes all the way from your head all the way down to your bottom. Now, all of our, most of our taxidermied animals have vertebrae. They're not in them anymore, but they're what we call vertebrate animals. Um, and so there are birds, our mammals, um, even fish are vertebrae. And a whale is a mammal, a very, very big mammal, which is why its vertebrae are so big. And this is actually only part of one, it's all broken um, because it was actually found on a beach. So after the whale had naturally died at sea, um, this, uh, a lot of bones had washed up on the beach. And it's really interesting because a whale has to swim and a whale has to float. And if I go to my other camera again, to get a close up look, you'll be able to see it's all really rough. And it's got all these like holes in it. So often kids will say it looks like a pumice stone that's made by a volcano. And it does look similar because it's got little pockets of air in it. So whale bone is really, really interesting. And the reason they've got little pockets of air is because they need to be able to float and swim. So they don't want to be too heavy. Uh, and so lots of different animals have different adaptations. So whether it is their bone structure or even their teeth. Um, so this is a whale tooth. And a lot of people don't realize that there are some whales that do have teeth and some whales that don't. And so this is a sperm whale tooth. And so that's definitely something I'd encourage you guys to go back and actually do some research about which is which. What different species of whales have? Some have teeth and some don't. Um, All right, so have we had any other questions come through? Yes, Megan, we have had a question about why we preserve bones. So why does the museum want to preserve the bones and, and things like the, the teeth as well to, to keep, to look after? All right, so we know that animals change, but also museums love to learn about animals. And what we learn about animals is always changing. Scientists are still doing research both on live animals, but also going into museum collections and using different types of scientific equipment and testing to actually test the types of uh, bones and, and preserved skins and feathers of different types of animals to learn more about them. Um, whale teeth are also really interesting. So this one doesn't have any on it, anything on it. But a lot of whale teeth you might see in a museum has carvings and engravings in it. And so they're also a type of artwork called scrimshaw. So at the Maritime Museum, we have lots of these beautifully carved and engraved whale teeth that the people who sailed um, in the olden days used to do before they, they didn't have phones or television in their spare time, they would actually do scrimshaw and carve into whale teeth and whale bones. So we have it for its scientific purpose. Um, in the education team, we have them. So we can talk to kids just like you all about these animals and really get us inspired to learn more about them. Um, and also, we, yeah, for the science and for the artistic value of them. Um, I actually read an article recently about scientists are still trying to work out how much food do whales eat. Um, so it's absolutely wonderful what they all the science that still keeps on going about our animals. Thanks, Megan. We've also got a sort of follow-up question about where you find them or, or get these different bones and artefacts from. All right. So at the museum, it's actually really interesting. We get stuff from lots of different places. So, so and you have to be really, really careful because a lot of animals are protected. So particularly with our ocean animals, we have to be very, very careful of what is protected. For example, we have examples of turtle shells. Now, turtles, you can't go and hunt them. But what the ones we've actually got were seized by customs, people trying to export them illegally, and customs gave them to us to look after to help with our education programs and help teach people about how precious turtles are. But you can't go and buy those things. Other times you can buy um, animal specimens online after penguin here was actually found in a antique shop so sometimes we can find things in lots of different places 
And sometimes we have to, some things are really special and we have to look after them. I'm going to grab something that's not an animal specimen, but is really, really special. Just give me, I'm just going to make some room to put it down. So sometimes we get things um, to look after from something like a shipwreck. And so shipwreck artifacts, while not relating to animals, are still really important to maritime museums. And so, for example, we look after these items and these are actually the government has laws in place to say that we have to protect and care for these types of objects. And it's like, there's a button, a little button from a shipwreck. So this is from a shipwreck called the Dunbar. And so all of these items are really, really special and really, really important. And sometimes we have real artifacts and sometimes museums will have replicas or fake artifacts. And the reason for that is sometimes not everyone can get a real crocodile skull, but we can get a replica crocodile skull. It's still the same size. It shows us all of the details of this crocodile. And I want you guys to have a think. How big do you think this crocodile would have been when he was fully grown? This is a saltwater crocodile skull. Have a thing, talk about it in your classes. This crocodile was bigger than two meters, bigger than three, four, bigger than five meters. He could have been probably about seven meters long. So a crocodile with a skull this size would have been about seven meters long. So there's not gonna be many of those um, crocodiles who are, we can get the real thing. So that's why museums also get replicas made. Um, and so this, this replica was bought from a company that specializes in making, making really nice, good quality replicas so that we can touch it, we can hold it. And people who come to the museum can actually touch and hold and interact with these things to learn more about these animals. Um, Megan, we also had a question about why does it look like there are price tags on all of the objects? That is a really, really wonderful question because they a lot of these objects actually do have tags on them. Um, so, for example, I can show you uh, this uh, camera here. This is a camera. Um, and it has a tag on it. It's a nice, clear one. And... The reason we have this is that museums have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of objects. So just in the education storeroom that I went to to get these things, we have over 600 different objects. So we have to know which is which. Some of them might look totally different. Some of them look really similar. And we have to know which is which and we have, have to have a computer database that we can learn more about them and we can see what it's called, uh, when we bought it, things like that. So that's why we have a tag here. It's got a number. So this number is EC000485. So if we go into our computer system, we can look up that number and we can match it to this Kodak vest pocket folding camera. And we can learn more about it. And it will tell us a little bit about this camera, which, oh, it's a bit stuck. But that bit comes out, it's probably about a hundred years old as, as well, again. And this was a type of camera that was used by lots of photographers around the time of World War I. It was also used by photogra a photographer that this type of camera was used by a photographer that went to Antarctica. Um, so the tags actually help us keep track of all of these objects, help us know a little bit more about them. And it allows us to be able to say, to someone else, I want to borrow object number this, and then they can go and find it. They'll find the tag, um, which is connected to the object. And sometimes when we're putting something on display in the museum, we'll very carefully take 
the tag off, but we have to make sure that the tag goes back on. We update our computer system with its location, with the object's location, and make sure we keep track of everything. Because of course, as I said at the start, all of these objects belong to the public of Australia, belong to the Australian people. And we would get in really big trouble if we lost anything. <laughs> Excellent, Megan. We do have another question, if you've got time, about oh, yeah. <laughs> do sharks and whales lose their teeth? Because um, this person, uh, Nima, had found a tooth and was wondering how it got there. All right, so this is a really good one. I'm going to hold up my uh, whale tooth again. This is one of the ways sharks and whales are totally different animals. So a whale like this, a sperm whale, doesn't get as many teeth as they like. Um, so pretty much they have to have the same set of teeth uh, their whole lives. So most mammals will only have a limited number of teeth. Whereas shark, and I didn't bring one um, up onto this beautiful terrace with me, but shark can have as many teeth as they want. Um, I read somewhere that some species of shark could have up to 30,000 teeth in their lifetime. Um, so shark teeth are totally different shape and size to a whale's tooth. So this tooth is very big and thick and chunky and strong. It's not going to break. Um, it's really quite firmly attached into the whale's mouth. Um, he's not going to lose, he or she is not going to lose it. Whereas shark teeth are a lot smaller generally. And um, they're actually designed so that if they get damaged, uh, if they get caught in the fur of an animal, the shark is trying, or, or the scales of a fish that the shark is trying to trying to attack, they actually just pop out, um, and the shark will get new ones. Um, so if you ever get the chance to look at a shark jaw or look at a picture of a shark jaw, you'll see they have rows and rows and rows of teeth. And the ones at the back are really small. They're only just forming. Or it's the ones at the front are the ones they use all the time. And it's basically like disposable cutlery, like plastic knives and forks that as soon as they break, you just throw them out and get a new one. Oh, that is fascinating. So we've got a, a couple of uh, final questions. So one is, do, um, why do whales eat plankton? And the other one is linked to that about um, are sharks and whales related? All right. So we'll start with sharks and whales related first. Uh, no, they're not related. So whales are mammals like us and dolphins as well. Um, so whales and dolphins are related. Um, and so they have, they're, they're very much like us. They're warm blooded. They have um, it's kind of skin like us. They have um tiny little bit of not really hair like us but they are they're mammals um and interestingly a whale skeleton actually looks quite quite interesting because you can see in their flippers they do have very long fingers um but it's they've kind of all turned in, into flippers but a shark is a fish so if you think like a goldfish fish are very very different um, they'll have scales and shark skin is a little bit different to scales again, but they're a whole different family of animals. Um, and they're actually a lot, shark, it's a really old family. There was a type of shark called the Megalodon, which was a massive shark, which was swimming around at the time of the dinosaurs. Um, so they're a lot older um, than our modern uh, whales and dolphins. And some uh, whales eat plankton. So the types of whales that don't have any teeth. So like a sperm whale like this would eat seals and fish and squid. But a baleen whale, like a blue whale, doesn't have any teeth. So if it doesn't have teeth, it can't eat anything that's crunchy. It can't eat anything that's particularly big. So it eats those tiny little plankton um, and it eats huge amounts of them. So different animals have actually evolved to eat different types of foods because where the baleen whales live, there's lots of plankton. It's nice and easy. Um, they can just swim around with their mouth open. They don't actually have to chase the prey. Whereas if you're, if you're a whale trying to eat a, eat a, um, chase a seal or a big fish or something, you have to chase it. So different animals, whether it's whales or any type of animal, evolved different um, different types of teeth, different behaviours, depending on what food they eat, where they live. Um, and, yeah, they've evolved into different types of animals. All right. I'm just trying to see, look at the time. 
Excellent. Thank you so much, Megan. I just, um, uh, we've pretty much got to most of those questions. There was one about sharks. Um, are there any sharks that are herbivores? And where did you find that too? So maybe we'll finish <laughs> off with those two. All right. Um, I'm actually not exactly sure where we got this tooth was. This tooth has been at the museum longer than I've been. Um, so I'm not sure exactly where, where this particular specimens come from. Um, but I do know lots of different specimens have come from different places. And I actually recently got told that there are, is a type of shark that is an omnivore. So it eats both plants and um, and animals. So different sharks, of course, have different diets. Um, most sharks are not going to eat really large um, things, anything like a human. Um, there's only a couple of species that are dangerous to us at all. Um, still don't go poking sharks. They will defend themselves, but they're actually not going to attack a human. They will attack what they think might be a turtle or something like that. But some, a lot of sharks don't eat big animals. And I'm not sure exactly what the name of the shark was, but I did read here recently that there was one that does also eat plants as well. So there might be a herbivore shark out there. That's something that I'm actually going to go and research um, and you guys can research too. Definitely check out your school libraries. Um, they might, they'll have heaps of amazing books on all of different types of ocean animals and history and all sorts of different things. Um, so now we can get back to school. Definitely check out your libraries and come visit the museum. Um, in the school holidays, we're going to have lots of amazing um, activities and things for you guys to do. Karen from Australian Environmental Education and we're going to explore what's in your backyard with a big focus on invertebrate animals. So they're those animals without a backbone and I've got a whole lot of things here that we're going to have a closer look at and you're going to help let me know if you've seen them before. So there'll be a few things that I'll ask you to put in the chat that might be yes you've seen this or a guess of what you think this um this clue might be, um, but also then you can put your um, full questions in the Q&A and we'll get to those as well. So I'll start off with a couple of things that I discovered in my backyard. Now, oh, are we gonna focus? Just thinking about it, that's better. Now, these may be things that you're familiar with, like, something like this, a cicada exoskeleton. You may have seen something like this before or even something like this. Now, I find lots of these in my backyard and I'm not going to tell you what they are just yet. But I also have a couple of my live animals here to show you as well. So we've got a spiny leaf insect here, only about three months old and a much bigger, it's called a crown stick insect here as well. And I've actually got some that have just hatched out that I'll show you um, at the end of the session. And they're just to give you a comparison of how big they will grow. So I've got lots of pictures to show you as well. And we'll be having a little look about some of the things that you may or may not have seen. So it's all about discovering some of the clues about what is in your backyard and how you might be able to identify different things that you might have seen, but not know what they are. So this is my backyard in full bloom. And I've been doing lots of different planting to encourage lots of animals into my backyard. So I've got plants that like that flowering plants will bring pollinators in, but I've also got lots of places in my backyard for animals to hide. So all the way back in the tree here, I've got an insect hotel. But I've also got a frog hotel up against the fence there with all of those tubes for tree frogs to hide in. But also all of these plants create lots of great habitats for many small animals. And I have to say, a lot of my insect hotels often end up with those little garden skinks living inside. So they seem to love my insect hotels, maybe because there's lots of food inside. 
But this particular garden has also is what I call my spider garden because there are so many different evidence and clues of spiders and many different species in this garden. So if we have a close look at the, um, the orange circles here, we have St Andrew's cross spiders, lots of spider egg sacs. This one here just looks like a really weird, fluffy kind of cloud. And if we look closely, these are baby spiders called spiderlings. So it's one of my, it's my second favourite baby animal name, spiderlings. I absolutely think it's adorable. And I have so many spiderlings and not just spiderlings. Now they have been growing up into adult spiders. So lots of different types. Now these ones here, there's so many in that one spot. If they all stayed there, there's not enough food. There's too much competition. So baby spiders do something really cool called ballooning. So they'll actually let a piece of silk out of their spinnerets, out of their abdomen. And when they're very small, they're really, really light. So that um, silk can catch the wind and will blow into a different area. So it will help that um, baby spider, that spiderling travel to a different area. So we don't end up with too many spiders in one spot. Well, I have to say, I quite like the baby spiders. I've got spiders in, um, living in my office as well as outside my office, keeping all of the insects uh, numbers down. So I quite like having them around. But let's have a look at some other clues. We might have noticed what I showed you before, one of those cicada exoskeletons. Start looking out. In the next few weeks, we should start seeing those cicada exoskeletons um, on the edge of brickwork, on fences, on trees. Um, keep an eye out. And it's actually listening is one of the great clues that you've got cicadas around. If you don't ever see those exoskeletons, you may actually know you've got cicadas from the sound. So by listening to lots of, um, lots of the sounds in your backyard or your school or local park, you can find out a lot about the animals living near you. You might hear buzzing of bees, you might hear the buzzing of mosquitoes or that classic cicada sound. Um, we've got a question there about do spiders get hurt by falling? So when spiders are very little, they, they don't really hurt, um, hit the ground very hard. They're very, very light but also they do have silk. So a lot of the time they can just put another thread of silk out to stop them hitting the ground. So they're very clever. Now, if you haven't seen an adult cicada, this is what they are doing coming out of their exoskeleton. Here we go. So we can see that split in the back of the cicada. So the adult actually will emerge from the exoskeleton and leave this hard bit behind. Now, if we have a look, they look really different at this stage. They don't have wings. These guys spend seven to 10 years underground um, waiting. And they are a type of bug. So they are sap suckers and they are actually um, sucking the sap around the roots of trees and plants. And then when they're ready, they will emerge. Now, that's really tricky. What could have happened in those seven to 10 years? Maybe there's concrete from where they had burrowed down. Maybe there's a house. Maybe there's a park, maybe there's a road. So it can be really tricky for cicadas, but they can't actually always come back up through the surface. So sometimes they're lucky and they can find a way through, but other times um, they actually sort of get trapped underground when it has just emerged from their exoskeleton. They need to dry their wings and they will actually change colour. This is a green grocer cicada and it hasn't gone dark green yet. So it's resting, drying its wings this is when they're most vulnerable to predators as well. So you could be really lucky to be at the right place at the right time to see one of these cicadas emerging. But other times you might just see the exoskeleton left behind or hear the cicada calls way up in the tree. And I love this picture. They've captured accidentally a little ant off to the side as well. So you never know. It's always great to try to take photos when you're exploring your backyard or your local park, because you never know what you might find. Now, I showed this one before as well. This is one that I do have a lot of in my backyard. I found one just the other day. This one is almost, it's attached to the branch like this one we can see here. And if anyone wants to pop into the chat, what you think this might be? Does anyone would like to have a guess?
Hmm. Lots of people are thinking. Uh, praying mantis cocoon, a caterpillar. We've got another cocoon. Oh, it looks a bit like honey. Well, guys, absolutely spot on. We, it is a praying mantis cocoon. So a cocoon, not quite the same as what you'd have with one caterpillar inside. It has many um, baby praying mantis eggs in it. So what the female does, it lays this foamy mass that's got the eggs sort of inside it and it lays this shape. And then when the eggs hatch out, they hatch out, hatch out from this foamy shape. And there could be hundreds of eggs in this praying mantis egg sac. So it's an egg sac as opposed to a cocoon. And it is from a praying mantis. And here's one that had just hatched out. And if you have a look at your pinky fingernail, it was smaller than my pinky fingernail. And it, as you can see from this picture, almost transparent. It was or white, almost see-through. Now, guys, I found this the day I was photographing in my spider garden. So unfortunately, I don't think this baby praying mantis um, survived. But I do know that I've got plenty around because this is an adult. So this particular species is about five centimetres in size. And I found this adult um, in my backyard as well. So definitely know that these um, praying mantis are going through their full cycle and some of them are making it to um, adulthood. That's why a lot of animals like this have lots and lots of young, lots of eggs. So that gives them a better chance for some of them to make it um, to become an adult. Um, Thomas has asked, is the one that I had fertilized or had it already hatched? So all of the ones I've been finding are empty. So I can usually tell because um, they're, they're quite hollow and light and they're a bit squishy, which means all of the stuff inside has made its way outside. So um, it, it is empty. And it is really important to make sure that you are very careful when you are collecting things um, that it doesn't have something living inside. Okay, let's have a look at our next clue. Hmm. So this one here is about 10 centimetres long. I've seen some that are about 50 centimetres long. And usually, if I just zoom out a bit, they're usually hanging like this off a branch. And there's lots of different sizes and a few different species. So let's have a look. We've got some stick eggs, tree bark, a cocoon of a moth, uh, stick insects, uh, caterpillar cocoon. So guys, good combination of guesses there. This one is a case moth cocoon. So it gets its name because it makes these silk woven cases. Sometimes they're called bag worms or bag moths. And they is a living animal inside. Now, there's not a living animal in this one anymore. I have had um, a couple of live ones living in with my stick insect enclosure and they come out and munch on the leaves. So you'll see it hanging upside down like this. And they make the silk and they chew off little bits of stick and attach it to the edge of their cocoon. Now, they are super weird that was living with my stick insects. So they would come out this very um, quite big, kind of about, they can get up to about the size of your thumb in sort of diameter and thickness. I love this picture because you can see it's like he's wearing a little um, woolly jumper. So this is the silk. So this is a very close up photo of the silk around the edge of the cocoon. Um, and they open it up, they come out, they chew on the leaves, um, and then they will pull themselves back into the cocoon and tighten it up like pulling a drawstring and tightening it up the top. So quite amazing. My next slide here that I wanted to show you is something else that uses silk. Now, most of you know that spiders will use silk, but does anyone know that they can actually build with them as well? Now, I'll give you guys a couple of chances to maybe put into the chat whether you know what type of spider this is. Now, a lot of the time, the common names of animals are related to what they look like or something that they do. Okay, so I'll let you have a little think. A few people uh, recognize this spider already. And it is what it looks like, a leaf curling spider. Now, what the spiders do, they munch off a leaf when it's still green. And then they use their silk to sew it closed. 
And as they sew it closed, it curls. And then when that leaf dries, it stays in that shape. So they've got a, usually a, a sort of a messy looking orb web, which is one of those circular sort of classic shaped webs. Then they will make this leaf on the inside. Now, this is one I was really lucky to catch, which was actually looking down the center of the curled leaf. And I didn't think I got anything in the photo till I looked at it later. And I can see the stripy pattern of the leaf curling spiders abdomen. Now, again, if you have a look at maybe your thumbnail, the abdomen is no bigger than your thumbnail. So it is a, a relatively small spider and uses that camouflage of hiding in there to help protect, it, protect themselves. And this is one sticking out the bottom there. Again, lots of different types. I've even seen a leaf curling spider use a piece of rubbish, a chocolate wrapper to curl up to make its shape. Okay, so caterpillars, this is often something that you might see in your backyard. So the two things that you can see in this photo, one is those munch marks out of the leaf. So lots of the animals I'm look, we're talking about at the moment are herbivores like those caterpillars, and stick insects, so they're going to eat leaves. So sometimes you'll see these little munch marks that can be a clue that it's a caterpillar, could be a stick insect or another insect that's a herbivore. Sometimes you could be super lucky to see the entire caterpillar. Other times you may see the adult moth, a butterfly in this case. Other times you might see this. This is a chrysalis um, and that's that after the caterpillars had enough to eat, they form a chrysalis and essentially kind of dissolve themselves and reform um, into an adult butterfly or a moth. I was very lucky to find this one outside my front door and uh, there was two caterpillars. One had just turned in to the chrysalis here and the other one was still munching to get um, big enough to and enough energy. So over the space of a couple of weeks, I went out every day and I watched and the chrysalis changed color and eventually the adult butterfly emerged. I can actually see the little chrysalis at the top here that's now see-through as it's emerged. Now, again, like the cicada, they need to dry their wings before they can fly away. So I was super lucky to get this one drying its wings. So I was able to get a photo of it before it flew away. Now, a bit of moth butterfly trivia. One of the ways that you can tell them apart is looking at their antennae. So butterflies, uh, this one here has straight antennae and moths have feathery antennae. Moths generally come out at nighttime and are usually more neutral in color. Butterflies are generally out during the day and are brighter in color. So that's one of the ways that you can tell these two groups apart. Now, this is a different one. This is one that lives in, um, well, in my backyard as well, it starts its life in fresh water. So I'm wondering if you wanted to have a little guess of what you think this animal is. So a lot of the things we're looking at have different life cycles and it's different parts of those life cycles can give us a clue about what it is. So we've got a couple of guesses coming in already. Oh, well done everyone. So it is a dragonfly nymph or dragonfly larvae. And I think it's the eyes. It's especially around the head is one of the clearest ways that we can identify it. Uh, as we are looking. And this was one, again, found in my backyard next to my frog pond. And oh, it was a super lucky day that I was able to capture this photo. It's probably one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen, looking at those amazing wings and that beautiful colour on its tail. Um, I tend to get quite a few dragonflies in my backyard. Last year, because we'd had a bit more water than the years previously, I had so many different types of dragonflies um, in my backyard flying around. And again, I was really lucky that it was just that moment that it newly emerged from its exoskeleton and it was drying its wings. So I was able to get, it was probably there for about 10 minutes, so I was able to get photos um, before it flew away and pretty much um, didn't stop moving after that. So it was quite amazing. What are those big brown things on the top of the dragonfly? That is from um, uh, Rosbella. Um, these ones here, they're the eyes. 
So absolutely amazing. The adult um, dragonflies have huge eyes and we can see it a little bit here off to the side when it's a nymph, the really big eyes on the side of its head. And it's all about trying to, um, to see as much. And these guys, they are not herbivores. Dragonflies, both as nymphs and as adults, are sort of carnivores. So they are flying through the air and they're catching little flying insects as they're moving around. Uh, we've got another question here um, uh, from Thomas. He saw a dragonfly that was 15 centimetres long. Some of them can get really big. I photographed one up in um, the mid-north coast, which was probably about 10 centimetres in size. This one was probably about uh, eight centimetres or so. Um, so some of them can get really big. And again, if you're in the right place at the right time, you might be able to capture one of these great photos. Now, this was a first for me. I don't see a lot of these in my backyard. And these are damselflies. So damselflies and dragonflies look quite similar. We can see, again, really big eyes is something that is quite similar. But again, you can tell dragonflies and damselflies apart about where their wings are when they're resting. And they do stop from time to time. So the damselflies will rest with their wings flat along their body and dragonflies will have their wings out. So that's one of the ways, if you weren't sure and you think, oh gee, they look alike, you know it's a dragonfly, their wings are out flat like this and a damselfly, the wings um, along its body. So a little, Little bit of uh, tricks to help you identify these different animals. Now, sometimes the things are really, really small. So this is the top of a bottle, a bottle brush flower. So if it gives you just a little bit of an idea about how small that spider was, it was an absolute miracle that I discovered it and was able to get a photo of it. And if again you look at your pinky fingernail, that is getting to about the size of that spider. It was probably even smaller around. Um, what do insects do inside their cocoon? So it very much depends. Things like the case moth that are in this kind of um, cocoon all the time, yep, they're just sleeping and resting, coming out to eat, going back in. Um, other ones, when they're going in that chrysalis, they are changing. So they're going through what we call metamorphosis, and it's a big change of their, um, of their body shape, going from a caterpillar to um, to a butterfly or a moth, so it is a it's a lot of energy, and that's what we call a complete metamorphosis that they go through that stage into the chrysalis. Things like cicadas and dragonflies go through a really big change as well, but it's called an incomplete metamorphosis because they don't go into that chrysalis stage; they just emerge from the exoskeleton and leave the the shell behind, and then um, they usually in that the main thing that they do is they grow their wings. So quite, quite amazing. There's a lot that they're doing. Now, let's just have a look at my stick insects here again. We've got two more minutes. Oh, oh I'm having lots of fun with my buttons today. I think it's because I switched which side my um, stick insects are usually on. So here's that crown stick insect we were looking at before gets its name from the little crown on the top of its head here. But I just want to show you the babies. Oh, I've got two here. They're very quick when they're young. And I've got to try to catch it. Let's see if I'll get it sit on its back. Oh, it's on my speaker now. So that is how big the baby is. You can just see it on the back here. So they hatch out of an egg, which is even smaller. So the eggs are absolutely tiny. These guys come out of those eggs. And we'll see if I can zoom in a little bit better. And they will go through the stage where they shed their skin and grow and shed their skin to grow. Here we go. We can see the little guy there. And they will develop all the way into this full size stick insect. So they go usually through about seven stages of shedding their skin to grow from this size all the way to a full adult here. So that's a lot of growing and a lot of eating that needs to be done. And they do like to drop quite a lot. So I need to be very, very careful that I don't lose them 
um, but they are really, really small. So the eggs are tiny. Oh, <laughs> this dropping again. So the eggs of these species are very small. So when we're exploring what's in your backyard, you never know what you might find. It could be that you've got some clues because you've found a cocoon, an exoskeleton, an egg sac, maybe even the eggs of an insect. Or if you're lucky, you might have seen the adult insect as well. Sometimes it could be the sound, the sound of a cicada, the sound of a bee. These are all different clues that you've got these other animals in your um, environment. Um, will the parents eat the babies? Um, that's a really great question. And in the mini beast world, those invertebrates, those insects, and those spiders, it really varies. So things like the stick insects won't eat their young because they're herbivores. But when you're thinking about spiders and praying mantis and those kinds of things, absolutely, you may find that um, some of those ones, once they hatch out, they need to move off because they could become lunch. And it might be that they don't become lunch of the, of the parent that laid the egg sac, but it could be the other siblings and brothers and sisters. Anything slightly bigger than them, it is becoming part of their food. So it's, uh, it, it can be quite a tricky one that you think, oh, it's a, it's a difficult world being a mini beast in these environments. And a lot of it is why they have so many young, why they have so many eggs, um, baby spiders, baby praying mantis, so many of them. So enough of them will reach adulthood and they can start the cycle again. So by creating some really awesome insect hotels or habitats and plants in your backyard, school or local area, you can create lots of tiny little habitats, which will mean those animals are protected. Okay, I've got time for just one more, well, two more questions. How big do stick insects get? Well, it depends on the species. Some of them, the biggest one in Australia is about 30 centimetres in size. The crown stick insect here, this is a this is a full size. This is a full size female. She's almost oh, over a year old. And that's about, you know, the size of my hand. So 10 to 15 centimetres in size. Um, other species are smaller, but certainly there, there are many species in Australia that get to about that size. And where last question is, what is the most venomous spider? Um, well, that is going to be the Sydney funnel web. Uh, but no one has died from a funnel web spider bite since the 1980s because we have excellent anti-venom. So, okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining me for the What's in Your Backyard series. And Welcome back. As I said, it is a quick day of sessions today. So we're halfway through. So thank you everyone for joining us. We now have Joe from Geoscience Australia to talk about earthquakes. Yuma, everybody. Uh, welcome to our earthquake excitement webinar. My name is Joe and joining me behind the scenes is my friend Shona. Uh, we're both members of Geoscience Australia's education and outreach team. So Geoscience Australia is a place where lots of Earth scientists work to try and better understand our amazing planet and also our country, Australia. And one of my jobs is to work with young scientists like you and your teachers to explore Earth science and hopefully have a little fun along the way. So I'm really, really excited that you're joining uh, me here today. So as we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land of which I'm presenting for, from the Ngunnawal people. And we recognize first Australians as the very first um, educators, the first innovators, and the first scientists of these lands. And we pay respects to them, their continuing culture, and their elders of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And a very warm welcome to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. So as you know, this is a webinar, so unfortunately I can't see your wonderful faces, but uh, we do invite uh, questions down in the Q&A box and my friend Shona will be helping out uh, with those and we might answer, be able to answer a few at the very end. So to start with, I would like to tell you a little story about me. And this story happened on the 22nd uh, of September this year. Uh, I was at home in Canberra on my laptop, looping away, uh, sitting at my kitchen table on a Zoom to my workmates. And then I started to feel just a little 
bit strange. I was feeling a little bit dizzy. And the screen in front of me started to wobble. And I looked down, and the table was wobbling too. Was, was I unwell? Then I look over at my glass of water, and there were little ripples inside that glass of water. And then it struck me. I was experiencing an earthquake. And that was really, really excited. And I wanted to learn more. But lucky, so lucky for me, uh, at Geoscience Australia, there are a dedicated team of scientists working um, on understanding and monitoring earthquakes in Australia, but also all around the world. And I was quickly able to figure out from, this, from, from our scientists that the earthquake that I experienced in Canberra actually happened 300, 300 kilometres away in Victoria. And I was able to feel it. Absolutely amazing. So shortly on your screen, you will see a picture of some of the damage that was experienced in Melbourne uh, as a result of this same earthquake. And very, very, very quickly, the media cottoned on. And we had some amazing headlines like vibrations, huge 5.9 magnitude earthquake sends shivers through a region. Earthquake rocks state. Victorians left shaken and stirred. A bizarre experience. And that pretty much sums up how my experience was of that earthquake as well. So it does highlight that earthquakes are relevant to us as Australians, and it is something that is worth understanding a little bit more. So let's do that. And I'm going to need all of your participation right now. We're going to do a little think, pair, share. That means you're going to turn to the person next to you, be that a brother, sibling, sister, a classmate, a teacher, or an adult in your life, and you're going to discuss this question. You're going to have 60 seconds. The timer has started now, and I want you to discuss what is an earthquake. I'm going to be just off screen, and when we come back, we're going to compare my answer to this question to your answer. All right, see you very shortly. All right, everybody, time is up. How did we go? Now, I want you to listen carefully and compare your definition to mine. For me, it's very, very simple. An earthquake is when the ground shakes or vibrates and is caused when rocks break under stress and release energy. Now you can compare it to something like just a stick from your yard, like I have here. And if I put this stick under stress, it eventually breaks. And I can feel those little vibrations in my hand. So in this picture that you see up on your screen, you can see the ground, the green ground with the trees on top and the brown rock underneath. Now, sometimes the rock breaks and it will move upwards. It might move downwards. It might move sideways. But whatever it does, when, if, it does if it does break and move, it will release energy as these vibrations. And they'll travel through the ground. And that's what these red lines you can see on the picture represent. So when an earthquake occurs, what might happen? Well, nothing might happen. If the earthquake is very, very, very small, or very far away, something might happen. We might get really small things like a little bit of shaking, some things might fall over. You might even hear some vibrations or rattling. If the earthquake is a little bit stronger, we start to get to the point where we might be damaging some of our infrastructure. You can see these big cracks in a road. Or 
as we see in this picture from the Peterman Ranges in Central Australia, we see this big line across the, set, the, the picture and there's a blue arrow pointing towards it. And this is actually the exact place where an earthquake happened in 2016. And this is called a fault line to geologists. Now, we also might get uh, damage to the places that people work and live. And as you can see here in this picture, we've got some damage to um, a school actually in, in Newcastle. And this occurred in 1989. And elsewhere in the, in the city, we unfortunately had um, a number of people die. So we can see that the effects um, of earthquakes can be quite severe. And these effects that I've just described here can and do happen in Australia. So it's important that we are earthquake aware. However, there are other effects of earthquakes that are possible in Australia, but are less likely to significantly impact us. And these include things like landslides, where you have loose soil and debris falling down a hill, or very large tsunamis, where there's been an earthquake uh, out to sea, and when that earthquake has happened, it's pushed water up and out in every direction, and some of that water might actually make its way to land and be quite destructive. And finally, we might get uh, some more unusual types of uh, earthquake phenomena. And you can see here, this little car has actually sunk into seemingly solid ground. And I'll draw your attention to the picture on the right, where there's a little pipe poking out of the ground. Now, I won't explain that just yet, because I'm going to show you a demonstration of this phenomena when I just move over to my second camera. And this demonstration is all about liquefaction. Now what we've got here is some moist sandy soils similar to the conditions where that car had sunk into the ground and that occurred in Christchurch in New Zealand. So let's put some heavy objects like uh, a building, I'm very proud of this, I made it myself, uh, a Hot Wheels car, broom broom, Let's put another building over here. And this is our city for this demonstration. And I want you to look closely at what happens when I apply a shock. I'm going to do an artificial earthquake, and there's going to be a little bit of sound, so excuse me for that. But our earthquake is going to start now. You can see that there's something happening, the buildings have started to sink and a few things falling into the ground, but if we keep watching... <laughs> Did you see that? The really heavy objects sunk into the ground, while it was a bit of a surprise for all of you, some light objects. So the, the, the soil jiggled, it made space for water to move to the surface, and what that meant is that the heavy things sank, whereas the light things started to rise to the surface. And that ping pong ball, not an egg as I saw in the comments, that ping pong ball is really light and it floated to the surface. And that's very similar to that pipe that we saw in the picture before. So we have sewage pipes and other things that are lighter underground can actually rise to the surface and we can have them uh, sort of come out on the top. It's really not something, maybe a little, might be a bit of a smelly situation if you have your sewage pipes move to the surface when your ground is actually shaking a lot. Now, as I come back to my other camera, what we've done here is we have explored some of the ways we can actually observe earthquakes and learn about them in that way. But we can't just do that. We need to, as scientists, we need to explore from many different angles. And there's, um, and we need to explore how to actually better understand these earthquakes. So how might we do that? Well, we have very special instruments all over Australia called seismometers. And I've got one here. And if I take off this protective case that made a good sound, we can see there's lots of nice things inside. Now this seismometer has some electronics in here and it also has a bit of metal and I hope you might be able to hear this. And that little bit of metal moves up and down, up and down, and up and down. And it responds to vibrations in the earth. So if we have uh, an earthquake, it's going to shake the ground 
the ground is going to shake the machine and it's going to move that little bit of metal up and down, up and down. And we're going to get a signal and it's going to go through a wire to um, some recording instruments that our scientists can use and analyze. Now I'd like to show you where we actually put those out in the field uh, in my next slide. So we have these seismometers actually installed all over Australia in complexes like this. On the left, you can see some solar panels, and that's to give the whole complex a little bit of energy and power. We have some um, satellites, and we also have this little shed. And inside the shed, we have some more equipment, but down the bottom is actually a trap door that our scientists go three meters into the ground and put those seismometers in there. And that's the instrument that I just showed you on screen before. It's down there to protect it from the weather. It's quite cool and stable down there, but it's also closer to the, to the, to the rock so it can feel those vibrations really, really well. Now, when those vibrations are detected, as I said, that signal goes to a different type of machine. It's called a seismograph. And this is a way in which we can visually represent the vibrations that, we, uh, that these instruments are feeling in the ground. And this can either be recorded on a fancy computer or um, in a more simple way, actually on a piece of paper on a drum like this. So here you can see a big drum and the white thing there is a, is a long piece of paper that is wrapped around this big cylinder. And that cylinder is always rotating and rotating slowly. And you might be able to see at almost the middle, but towards the top, there's a little pen drawing a line. And when there are no earthquakes, that, draw, that, that pen keeps drawing a straight line. And the tiny little ticks are just time indicators to show every minute passing. Now, it's going to keep drawing lines well, not, well, nothing is happening. But I want you to do a very short activity with the people around you. I want you to either, using a pen and paper or just your hands, I want, you to do, I want you to explore and have a think about what the pen would do if it detected an earthquake. So it's drawing in straight, 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 and earthquake hits. What next? What does the pen do? All right, I'm going to give you about five seconds while I get a video up. Go for it. Alrighty, everybody. I'm going to show you a video of this pen in action as it picks up an earthquake. And I'm wondering if you were able to predict the right outcome. All right, let's go. It's drawing a straight line and then suddenly an earthquake hits and we get vibrations. Those vibrations are detected in the ground, detected by the seismometer, sent through that wire to the machine, and then it's translated so we can actually see those vibrations on the page there. Now, when those vibrations stop, the, the, the pen will return to drawing just a straight line again. All right. We've now seen, we've just seen how, uh, how we record when an earthquake happens. Now let's explore the magnitude of earthquakes, which is another way of saying the size of an earthquake. Now this is a measure of how much energy is released. Remember that stick from before? During an earthquake and is recorded uh, as numbers between a zero and somewhere above nine. For example, the largest ever recorded earthquake was in Chile, uh, and it was recorded as a 9.5. So for this experiment, uh, and if this is an experiment that you can do in your classrooms or at home, I'm going to use some really technical scientific equipment, and it is called spaghetti. Now, we're going to pretend this one strand of spaghetti repre represents a magnitude five earthquake. And in this example, the amount of energy it takes for me to break this spaghetti is the same as the energy released in a magnitude 5 earthquake. Now, I want you to give a big thumbs up to the screen if you think I am strong enough to break this one spaghetti. I hope I have 100% of you 
with your thumbs up. Otherwise, I'll be very sad. All right, let's give it a go. Of course, you were right. I was right. I'm very strong. Great. But if we're going to go up to the next magnitude, so that was a five with one spaghetti, we're going to go up to a six. We're going to actually need to times that by 30 because every time we go up one digit in the magnitude scale, it increases in 30 times the energy. So in this example of magnitude six, we are going to need 30 spaghettis. All right. Will I need to put more energy in or less energy in to break these spaghettis? Let's give it a go. All right, it's definitely more. Ooh, that, whoa! It's raining spaghetti. <laughs> so we need to put more energy in. All right, we're going to move from a magnitude six to a magnitude seven. So 30 times 30, do some quick maths, Joe, 900 spaghettis. All right, more or less energy. Okay, I'll try again, I'll try again. All right, come on. Been going to the gym for this. Been training. Oh, no, I just can't do it. So much more energy goes in to a magnitude seven compared to a magnitude six. Now, going from a magnitude seven to a magnitude eight, we're going to need this many spaghettis. Now, I'm using a piece of paper, everybody, because when I went to Woolworths and I said, Woolworths, could you please give me lots of spaghetti so I can do a, an earthquake experiment with all these young scientists? They were like, yeah, cool. How much do you need? And I was like, well, if I'm going to go from a magnitude 8 to a magnitude 9 earthquake, I'm going to need this many spaghettis. And so needless to say, Woolworths was like, no, the pandemic has been tough enough on our stock levels. So they uh, unfortunately didn't get on board. But there's a huge amount of energy is released as we go up the magnitude scale. All right. So we've seen that the, the, the earthquakes can have different magnitudes. So actually, let's actually go and explore some earthquakes that are happening right, well, have happened very, very recently in Australia. Now, every single one of you can go and explore this website. It is uh, the Earthquakes at GA website. And this is where all those wonderful scientists I was talking to you about before uh, actually display and capture and record the earthquakes that are happening. Now, here we can actually see in the last seven days, we've had all of these earthquakes. We've had a couple of aftershocks from the Rawson earthquake. We have one in South, South Australia, and we've had some over in Perth. Now, as an example, let's go to the Melbourne ones. And if we click on it, we can see that it was a six no, a 2.6 magnitude earthquake. So a really baby earthquake. And to be honest, I don't think anyone would have uh, felt that. So we can see that earthquakes happen uh, actually all the time. We can even go in and see the results of those instruments, those wiggles that we have from the seismograph. Now, if we expand even further and go out the last 30 days, we can see that we've actually had quite a number of earthquakes in Australia, which makes me think, did any of you feel any of these? And the answer is probably no, because these are all really, really small earthquakes. And there are lots of small earthquakes happening all of the time. So in this context, we can think about uh, our earthquakes as either hazards or disasters. Now, if we go back to my PowerPoint, we can revisit these pictures here. And we can see the pictures that are on the screen do represent uh, earthquakes that have caused uh, big issues for communities. Now, these would be called disasters because they have had a negative impact on us, the community, and the buildings and infrastructure that we rely on. But if we compare it to all the little earthquakes that we've seen in Australia over the last 30 days, they're just hazards because they haven't affected us um, at all. So it's good to know 
that uh, you know we, we can define these and categorize these natural hazards in certain ways. Um, and it makes us uh, able to uh, better understand the big ones to, 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 to help protect us uh, in the future. Now, my final uh, slide over here, I want to briefly touch on the things that are keeping us safe. We know that lots of earthquakes are small and don't affect us, but sometimes there are big ones. As we have seen in Newcastle, and we, there were some big ones in Victoria that, we, that I experienced, and some, maybe some of you experienced recently. So there are rules that uh, builders must comply with to, to make buildings, buildings in a really strong uh, way, and also in a really flexible way. So we can have good foundations, those are the things that are underneath the building, keeping the building stable. And we can build buildings in a way that allows that building to actually sway and move in a flexible way uh, during an earthquake and just uh, move with the vibrations uh, instead of actually snap and break. So we have really good building codes in Australia, uh, which keeps majority of our buildings safe and sound. We also have the scientists like we do at GA constantly, and I mean 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every single day of the year, monitoring earthquakes here in Australia and around the world, keeping, um, ensuring that our emergency response personnel are up to date um, as quickly as possible. Um, because big earthquakes can occur uh, and cause tsunamis uh, that have occurred elsewhere in the world, they, there is a potential that it would, uh, could affect Australian coastlines. But lucky for us, uh, we can actually tell if a tsunami is coming and we can give coastal communities 90 minutes warning to, to leave houses and get up to higher ground. So that's heaps of time to respond to something that potentially is dangerous for us. So that's really good peace of mind, I think. Now, finally, I, as an educator, I'm a big fan of this. To help prepare, prepare for hazards and disasters, we can educate people. And if you take just one thing away from this little session, I want you to remember, drop, cover, hold on. This is one of the best things that you can do to protect yourself in an earthquake, if it happens in Australia, or if you happen to be overseas, um, is to drop to the ground, cover your head and get under something strong like a table. And this is going to prevent uh, hard things falling on top of you and keep you safe. And, I, uh, and, and that, that's a really wonderful thing to remember because it will uh, protect you and will keep you safe. I think we're going to wrap it up right here. I, I, we do have time for some questions and I believe my friend Shona has been helping uh, monitor the chat for that. So hello, Shona. How do we do? Hi there, Joe. We've just had a couple of questions and I've put some quick written answers in, but we might get you to expand on one about are we able to predict earthquakes, like accurately tell people when they're going to happen? Unfortunately not. Uh, predicting earthquakes is amazingly hard pretty much impossible. We cannot tell exactly when an earthquake will occur and we cannot tell exactly where an earthquake will occur. And if you're in the older age group and are doing some, some work on plate tectonics, we, we know where lots of the major earthquakes are likely to occur, but we just don't know exactly when. Um, so yeah, it's really, really difficult to predict the earthquakes and they, they're the one, they're, that's the energy that will come in the form of vibrations quickly to us and we'll feel it. But uh, in the case of tsunamis, for example, the um, the waves come much, much slower, which gives us an ability to to send out warnings to those coastal communities. So that's great. I don't have another question, but I will ask you one that I think people will be interested in. And that's why does why doesn't Australia have really big earthquakes like happen in some other parts of the world? No, it is a really great question, Shona. And again, it comes back to those that, that those tectonic plates. And the, the Earth is a big jigsaw puzzle made up of tectonic plates, and they're always moving. And at those boundaries, we sometimes get big earthquakes because we have large bits of rock basically colliding into each other, breaking in that regard. But Australia is really lucky because we live in the middle of a tectonic plate. So we don't have those two edges uh, jutting up against each other. However, we still get earthquakes because the stress that has, uh, is moving through the, 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 the plate, through Australia, will often find weak spots and it might break there. And one, an analogy is that if you um, are running and you fall over, 
most likely you're going to fall and you're going to protect yourself with your hands. One of the very common injuries uh, during a fall like this is not breaking your wrist, not breaking your arm, but actually breaking the collarbone here. That's because all the force of you hitting the ground is traveling up through the solid of, and finding the weakest part in your body. And that's where it will break. And that's very similar to the earthquakes that we get in Australia. Thank you, Joe. We don't seem to have any more questions. I'm looking at the time. We're probably ready to, to finish up. You let to well, finish off. Thank you, everyone. Um, Thank you so much for joining us. I do recommend you stick around for physics education and you can or, or you may or may not want to, but you can join me in an earthquake drill and you can drop cover. Hold on. <laughs> Thank you so much for that joke. everyone uh, my name is Peter from uh, physics education and uh, I'm really happy to be here for Clickfest. Uh, you, wow I was watching uh, the last session and it's really interesting all this stuff I mean earthquakes fantastic and uh, that's kind of leads into what I'm talking about forces and friction and uh, obviously earthquakes have a lot of force and friction kind of works in there as well. Um, so I know, like you've been told already, I can't see you, I can't hear you, but we can interact. Uh, we have, um, have Q&A down here somewhere. You can ask me questions as we go. I've got another screen. I see the questions. I'll try to answer them as I go. Um, but uh, otherwise I'll try to answer as many as I can at the finish. We don't have a lot of time. I've got so many things I want to show you. Um, so firstly, forces and friction, what are they? Well, you may have uh, heard of a, a, a scientist uh, from the 1700s named Isaac Newton. He came up with kind of laws of motion and he worked out that a body at rest will remain at rest and a body in motion will remain in motion unless it is acted on by an external force. What does that mean? Well, if um, you know, you're at the shops and you've got a shopping trolley and you give it a push, it'll keep going till it hits something. Uh, or if you give it a push and someone stops it, it stops it from being in motion. So that's pretty much the first law that he came up with. And um, we won't worry too much about the second law, that's a bit of mathematics, but the third law, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Now, everyone there watching, you can uh, join in with this. Let's um, just demonstrate that. Uh, yeah, that's, that's right, Lily. Uh, what comes up must come down. We'll get onto that sort of a force in a minute. But if everybody, like if you're sitting on the ground or you're sitting on a chair, just put your hands beside you, either on the chair or on the ground, and push down. Push down. So if I'm pushing down, which way do I go? Uh, now, there is another, there's a raise hand function. So I'm going to use that sometimes. I'm going to say, um, if I push down, put your hand up if you think I go up. Pushing down, pushing down. Have we got the raise hand function? That's okay. I think we go up. So I'm pushing one way, I go another. Oh, how do clouds stay up? Hmm. Uh, well, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Clouds stay up because way up high, it's colder. And what is in fact happening up there is that the water that's dissolved in the air is coming out of solution and we see it as clouds. Sometimes on cold mornings, you see fog. Fog is just clouds. It's just water floating in the air, water vapor. But 
let's get back to forces because I want to show you a couple of things. I'm going to zoom out. I've got, I've got so many camera angles here. Let's go out a bit like that. Let me get the whole room. Actually, I'll put it down to the floor because I want to show you something on the floor right here. Okay. I have a wheel. I have a wheel. So if I, um, if I roll it that way, so it's actually going that way, I wonder which way it goes. So rolling that way, let's see. It's off that way. I'll go the other way. It falls over. Now it does go that way as well. Now that was interesting anyway because it did fall over because I didn't spin it enough basically. So let's just look at that. So if I've got a wheel here, I stand it up and I let it go, it's just going to fall over. But if I spin it, like if you're on a bike, you can roll, roll along the road. But also if I spin it that way, I can just balance it on my hand. Mm. So it's in motion. It wants to stay in motion, but it also wants to stay in the angle in which it's turning. And that's another type of force. It's an angular force. All right. So the other thing is, like I, when I let the wheel go on the ground, it didn't just spin like that, did it? It took off. So we've talked about forces. That's talking about friction because the friction is the grip that the wheel has when it touches the ground. Let's do a bit of um, an experiment together again. Everybody put your hands together like that and rub them like that. Rub, 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 rub. Rub, 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 really fast, really fast, really fast. Ah, oh, it gets hot. So friction builds up heat as well. But if you push really tight together and try and move them, you can't. You can't rub your hands. You've got to let go a little bit. So when something like that, there's too much friction. And just going back to the earthquakes, that's like the tectonic plates together. They're holding onto each other until... Oh, the force is too much and they move past each other. Uh, another little thing to show you here. It's just a bowl with, this is just off uh, like Venetian blinds or, you know, blind uh, cord. Now, if I just let that sit there like that, it just hangs. But if I give it a bit of a tug, remember I said if you, if something's in motion, it'll want to stay in motion. Now, there is friction on the edge here holding the beads in place. But if I give it enough force, let's see what happens. Now, before I do that, let's have a look at the question. Does friction make things move faster? Um, actually, friction is a force holding things back. So if you imagine you're standing on a road, or the floor here, like my wheel was on the floor, or, or even in my shoes, I didn't slip over. If I was on an ice skating rink with ice skates, it's really slippery. So that means le that has less friction. So it actually, uh, with less friction, you slide, but more friction, you grip. Um, <laughs> Someone's got down into uh, nuclear physics. Um, yeah, there's a lot of space between atoms, but at our level of seeing things, they're touching. Uh, well, hmm, interesting. Uh, you know, what is, is it actually touching? We'll talk about non-contact forces in a minute. Let's have a look at my little experiment here. I was run out of time without doing any. Okay, so if I give that a bit of a tug, watch what happens. I don't want to lose it. Off camera, here we go. It kept going and going and going and going. So it didn't matter that most of the weight was in the bowl. The fact 
that the cord started going, it wanted to keep going and there wasn't enough friction on the edge to stop it. I've seen an experiment, I think it's on YouTube somewhere, where they had a cord that was about 20 metres long and it's so funny to watch because it, it just kept going. All right. Now, I've shown you how my wheel, I can just balance it on my hand. I have, oh, I don't know if any of you out there have seen these sort of things before. These are old LP records. And I've got one here and it's got a string on it, you see. I'll just zoom out a little bit. I've zoomed in. I didn't mean to do that. I meant to go out and out a bit further even. Um, let's just, there we go. Okay, so I've got the record on the string and if I just swing it like that, it just sort of flops around the place. But if I spin it like I spin the wheel, it stays in that plane. So that angular momentum is forcing it to stay in place. A bit more of a spin. That's how they used to uh, pretend to uh, film UFOs in the past and hang them in front of a camera like that. I think, unless they're real, then that's not how they do it. Okay, so we've looked at, you know, spinning things and uh, friction and sun forces, but forces act not just on solids. So we've, we've looked at, uh, oh, too close there. We've, we've looked at forces acting on solid things, but you know, air can be a force as well. We've all felt wind. Everybody do this. Someone mentioned atoms before. Um, so the molecules of air, when you do that, they're all hitting your hand and you can feel it. I have a helicopter here. If I blow air into my balloon, the air in the balloon is going to come out that way. It's going to go up. So if I then attach it to my helicopter, which way will it go? The air's pushing up. So will that mean it'll go down? Like when we were pushing down, we went up. There's a trick to this one. The air will push up, but then it's got these little tubes in the wings and that air will go along the tube and then slightly down, downwards, pushing the helicopter up, but also turning the helicopter blades. Let's have a look. And I'm gonna put a lot of air in and see what happens. Uh, yes, rubbing branches to make fire is friction. Exactly right. And just like when we were rubbing our hands, it built up heat. So building up a lot of heat can cause fire. So I've put a lot of air into my balloon. Let's see what happens. Go up. Oh, oh dear. It um, fell to the ground. Does anyone want to put in the Q&A why you think my helicopter actually fell Instead of going up, I put a lot of air in. That's the hint. The air pushed up, but it fell down. It fell down. I think we're tying in a gravitational force a little bit here as well. Um, no, there's not a lot of air resistance stopping it falling, but, but, I'll give a hint in a sec. The air's pushing up but it didn't lift it up, it fell down. Let me give you another hint. I'll just put in, ah, Hillary is correct. The air was too heavy because air has weight. Air can weigh something. Um, I'm just going to move the Q&A down so that I can see it. There we go. Yeah. So. Because it was falling already, it didn't give it enough. But let's let's do it again because we want to see it fly. I'll just put in a little bit. 
and it goes up. It flew up and I'll throw it over there. So it's the same with rockets. When a rocket goes up, it has a lot of fuel in it that burns and it's pushing down. So the, the flames from a rocket, if you've ever seen a rocket taking off, thrust, it's a word for force, and it pushes down. Now, I just happen to have with me here a little bit of a thing that I'm going to make into a rocket. I'm going to make into a rocket. So I, you've, we were talking about earthquakes and volcanoes are sort of uh, in the earthquake uh, genre as well. And you've probably all seen the old volcano experiment where we add uh, vinegar and bicarbonate of soda together to make a volcano. And of course, you add a bit of red food dye because it's got to look good. But I'm going to show you something here using vinegar and bicarbonate soda. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a chemical reaction. Does anyone know the gas that comes off that makes the volcano all fizzy? Does anyone know what that gas is called? What gas do you get when you add vinegar and bicarbonate of soda together? While you're thinking about that, I'm going to do it. But I'm going to eat red food dye because I'm making a rocket with the same. The, that's correct. Martin is correct. Carbon dioxide. Uh, it's not hydrogen because um, hydrogen is actually flammable. And I wouldn't want hydrogen gas uh, around me uh, with lights and all sorts of things because that would be a little bit dangerous. But carbon dioxide is correct. It's what makes all the fizzy drinks fizzy. So I've got this old thing here which is a film canister. Uh, now, I know all of you have digital cameras, but back in my day, uh, we'd have these, uh, we'd, we'd have film in this and you put it in your camera and after you took your 24 pictures, you take it to the chemist and they develop the film and they give you back photos about a week later and only two of them were any good. Whereas nowadays you can take a selfie and go, don't like that, do it again, do it again. Anyway, don't worry about that. Let's get on with it. I have one of these canisters and what I'm going to do is take the lid off and we'll zoom in in a sec when I'm ready to do it. And I've got all my ingredients uh, here. So I've got a little bowl because what I'm going to do is put a bit of bicarbonate of soda into my bowl. And there's a reason I'm going to make it into a bit of a paste. So I'm going to put the bicarb soda, it's just a powder put my lid back on so I don't spill it. I've got a little jug of water here. I'm just going to put the tiniest amount in. <gasps> Maybe too much. And I'm going to make it into a paste. I think I spilt a bit too much water. So now I've got to put more black carb soda in. There we go. Now, the reason I make it into a bit of a paste is because I don't want it to, um, don't want it to fall out of my lid. There we go. That's better. Okay, so I've made it into this beautiful, beautiful paste. And then I put it in the lid, my little lid here, like that. Beautiful. Should be fine. All right. And then, put that aside, I'm going to zoom in so that you can all see a bit better down to here. So, what I'm going to do, I've got also got this cup here. I'm going to put vinegar into my canister. Now, again, we've got to be careful with the amount of fuel, right? So I reckon about that much. Uh, I'm just answering a couple. What are you doing? Are you trying to make it erupt? Oh, maybe, maybe. I reckon, but I reckon that's about enough. 
So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put the lid on because see, that's got the bicarbonate of soda in it. That's got the vinegar in it. And this cup I'm going to use to put over the top because it is going to go off. I think I'll zoom out. I think we're a bit close. So oh, getting. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Now I've got this tray here because it's going to go everywhere. I get covered in vinegar and it smell, then I smell like fish and chips. So I am going to make it take off. Now, all right, let's talk about the forces because that's what we're doing here. So when these two things react, they give off a lot of carbon dioxide and that pressure is going to build up because this lid clicks on. But when the pressure builds up, It'll build up so much that just like an earthquake, something's got to give and the lid's going to fly off. Yes, Bryony, we're about to see what happens. Um, and I've got lights above me and this really shoots up fast. So that's why I've got the cup to stop it. So here we go. Put the lid on like that. Give it a shake. Oh, you had to, I hope you didn't blink. I hope you didn't blink. Now, usually I would do it twice, but we haven't got a lot of time. That pushed my hand up. So the force was really strong. If I hadn't have gripped this cup better, or if I had have not gripped it as well as I had, it would have shot off as well. So, uh, yeah, it, it, hang on, I'm just reading. Yeah, exactly like a rocket. That's my bicarb vinegar rocket. And it can go really, really high. It's really, you could, um, just so you know, on our website, Physics Education, um, there's free experiments and you can do it under adult supervision at home. Uh, do it in the backyard and never stand over it because, you know, it could hit you. So then I was right back here. I had the cup over it to protect my lights above me and also so I didn't splash vinegar everywhere. I'm glad you thought it was cool. Let's do something else. Now, I'm still going to... And Peter, oh. I have um, got the list of experiments in the email off to teachers and parents. So they'll get that um, in about 15 minutes. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, I've got a cute thing here to, to do with... Well, we, we, we kind of mentioned gravity before. Um, and gravity is a force and it's a non-contact force. So whereas we talked about pushes and pulls and friction, uh, gravity feels like it pulls you down. And in a way it does, but two masses draw each other together and the earth is pretty big. So it pulls us all towards it. Um, so I've got this little toy here and it's my, um, Woodpecker. Now, if I just use gravity, it can just fall down like that. But he's got a little spring on it. So there's another force acting. So when I pull him out like that, the spring pulls him back again. And he goes, and then that holds him in place. So then there's too much friction and he doesn't fall. But if I let him go and he does his thing, Ta -da. He eventually falls, but because he's springing back and forth, every time he springs back, it holds him in place. Then he comes up like that and he falls a bit. Then he springs back, he holds in place. Let's do it one more time. Takes a long time. We'll let him finish in a minute. All right, so I'm running out of time, but I want to show you at least one more thing because we've talked about air pressure a little bit and I have this fog machine here and I also have a bin, but my bin has got like a drum skin on top. So you can't really put anything in it. And it's also got a hole in it. Like, you know, it's kind of a rubbish bin, isn't it? 
That was a joke. Um, okay, so I'm going to, but, but see, if I do this, if I, like if I was at your school or wherever you are, and I hit the beating like this, you can even see the motion of it as the air pressure hits the end here, but you can't see it. So I want to put some fog into it and then we can see the actual shape of the air. Put some fog in. <laughs> Don't worry, it is literally just fog. All right, let's see if I can line up that camera and what shape will it come out? Ooh. It makes fog rings. So the air in, I'm going to turn on the air conditioner as well so you, that I'm not in a whole sea of fog there. Um, so when the air comes out of my bin, it comes out as a ring because the fast moving air coming out of the middle is sucking in all the slow moving air from around it. And then it goes into a beautiful ring. Um, we're up to five to three. And I think that's all my time. I'm happy to answer some questions if anyone has any questions. I think we've, oh, yes. Anyone have any questions about forces or anything to do with science? I'm happy to talk about even earthquakes, but you've heard all about earthquakes. I, uh, I love things about space. We talked a little bit about uh, gravity and of course all the planets and stars stay where they are because of gravity. The other non-contact force is magnetism. We've got a couple of little things here while you might think of some questions. Now these, these are all magnets and they just sit on this thing here. Ah, how do volcanoes erupt and what makes them erupt? Well, if you were here for the last session um, about geoscience, earthquakes and volcanoes are very much related and there's a lot of pressure under the earth and the tectonic plates that you heard about, the jigsaw puzzle, I like that term, um, they're moving around, why, you know, they must be moving on something that doesn't have a lot of friction because how would they move at all if the whole world was just a solid rock? And they move because underneath the crust of the earth is the mantle and the mantle is molten rock. It's so hot that rock has melted and volcanoes, what comes out of a volcano when it erupts? Lava. And that's just that molten rock coming out. And it's just pressure buildup. It's forces and not enough friction to stop it. And it comes out and blows up when it's, it's like a pressure cooker. And eventually something's got to give. And that's what happens with earthquakes and volcanoes. But just quickly back to my little magnets, because I want to show you, because this is cool. So they all just sit there like that. But then if I turn them all over like this, oh. they're all repelling each other. So magnets either push or pull or attract or repel. So they're all bouncing around on magnetism. And one more quick one. One more quick one, Karen. Um, this here is my little magnet that just, you know, there's magnets all through it. But if I put it on a certain angle, it's like, it's like it levitates. Floating in the air, that, on a sea of magnetism. That is. Thank you, Karen. Cool. Oh, thank you so much, Peter. And I would like everyone just to give a big thanks and a clap to all of our presenters today. What a great afternoon we have had um, exploring the Australian National Maritime Museum, thinking about what's in our backyard. 
learning about um, uh, earthquakes and of course looking at our forces and motion as well. So um, on behalf of Virtual Excursions Australia, it is wonderful to be able to have everyone here with us. So thanks everyone for joining us and look forward to seeing you all again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.